Um, my name is Jeremy Barme. I think we met already. Uh, this is my le second lecture for the Two China course for 2015. The topic today um, is that relates to shared destiny. Um, but I'll, before starting on the topic proper, I'd like to say a few words about other things. One is yesterday I discussed a new Sinology approach to the studying contemporary China. And in so doing, I said many things. I, ho I hope I've caused some disturbance or offense. If I didn't, then I've been wasting my time. Um, I must say that um, our approach in this center and the approach through the work we do through the China Story Project and the China Story Yearbooks uh, has caused some disturbance elsewhere, in particular in the People's Republic of China. We're presently finishing off uh, the editing, or rather design, of our latest yearbook, the 2014 yearbook. It's been delayed in production due to my ill health, but it is now final, nearing finalization. And you'll all have received, I hope, the draft layout of the introductory essay that I wrote for the yearbook. Um, the first yearbook in 2012 called Red Rising, Red Eclipse, caused the authorities in Beijing, Department of Foreign Affairs, or their Ministry of Foreign Affairs, to become quite agitated. And they formally complained to our embassy in Beijing, to the Australian Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade here in Canberra, and also to our centre. I was, uh, as luck would have it, at uh, Columbia University at the time, doing a launch of the yearbook in New York. However, I did respond to the Chinese embassy's complaints about the yearbook, and I wrote them a letter. And I think it just might be of interest to you if you want to follow up some of the ideas that underpin our center, um, the approach, the, what I call the demeanor that we have in dealing with the contemporary Chinese world. You might find it instructive to read the letter. I have put it up here online, but it's in the China Story site, which is thechinastory.org, and just search for embassy and you'll see a link to this letter. Now, it's a 6,000 word letter, that's one friend our first Australian ambassador to the People's Republic, Stephen Fitzgerald, remarked when I sent him a copy, he thought it was the longest letter the People's Republic Foreign Affairs Ministry had ever received from anybody in regard to one of their complaints. I'd asked the Chinese embassy to respond to their critiques or to follow up their critiques of our first yearbook by writing them up and we'd publish them on our China Story site. We believe in, as people in general, global, internationally recognized universities do, open debate and discussion and disagreement that is pursued through equitable exchange. Now, this is not the way the People's Republic of China engages in international discussion or debate within China. Therefore, we all have a problem. In the past, it was the problem of the People's Republic of China and its citizens. Now, because of the nature of the Chinese rise economically, politically, and increasingly militarily, it's a problem for everybody. And there we are. So if you're interested in how I respond to this problem, I'd suggest you look at that letter. I introduce it with the paragraph starting as if. And this is, again, my demeanor. And this will touch on shared destiny and our discussions today. For in my introduction, introduction to the letter, which I added before publish, publication in 2012, I said that the general approach that I take and the center takes is that we act as though the Chinese rhetoric about friendship, cooperation, equitable exchange, mutual understanding, I act as if all of that rhetoric, all of those words were true. I act as if China had already entered the 21st century. I act in my work and my relationship with the People's Republic as if we are not in a Cold War. And we here in the 21st century welcome people in the People's Republic of China to join us at any time they feel comfortable. However, as we will discuss later on in this lecture, I really believe that China, the People's Republic, in many ways is still very much a 19th century country, dealing with 19th century worldviews and attitudes and approaching things in a very 19th century fashion. Now, this is not to say, and if you're familiar with my work, You'll, it's not to say that Australia or America or what people call the American Imperium, the American global empire, or Europe or other countries act in any um, way that is not lost and mired in the past. It's not to say that China is being victimized in my view. However, to understand China's approach to things, I think we have to often look back to the 19th century, to that early phase of nation-state formation to better appreciate the motivations 
and the behaviors of the People's Republic today. Um, I've given you a, a list of readings. One is by George Magnus on the new Chinese proposed trade routes. Um, a second piece in Quartz gives various maps and details of the new trade routes and the proposed expansion of Chinese global trade. We'll talk about those maps in a moment. And the third thing is my introduction to the China Story Yearbook 2014, which takes us its theme, Shared Destiny, which I'll discuss in a moment. But before I do so, having already gone on about my letter to the Chinese embassy, that I think will give you some background. And I hope we'll forestall, if there's members, those of you who find my attitude or approach to the study of China too um, confronting, then I hope you'll read the letter before launching into some crude denunciation of me. I am aware that uh, people of my ilk, like white people aren't supposed to talk about China because we have no right, i.e. we don't have the right DNA. And if I was Chinese and making these statements, I'd also be wrong because I'd be reactionary or in thrall of American imperialism or part of the global cabal against the rise of China and its rightful place in the world or a sympathizer with Chinese dissidents negative elements, somebody who doesn't recognize the objective unfolding of history and China's inevitable rise as a major world power. I represent something backward, blah, 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 blah. I can assure you, I know every single propaganda line that anyone can spin about these matters. I've been dealing with China for nearly 45 years of my life. I have seen a political or cultural purge in China every two to three years for 45 years. I lived through the late Cultural Revolution. I went to Maoist universities before probably any of you were born. I, when Chairman Mao was alive and it wasn't some cute little joke or some little game that you all pick up because it's fun and oh, I'll wear a red badge or read a bit of Mao or quote a bit of China can say no to whitey because we Chinese are superior. I've seen it all. So all I can say is to members of the audience is get a grip, do some reading, and learn about the complex realities that I am trying to help introduce you to. Sorry for being a bit confront confrontational, but that's my job. I'm a, what they call an educator, whether you like it or not. Now, to go back to matters that we really didn't finish with yesterday, um, there are very good reasons that the People's Republic of China, it's led by a one-party state, it's authoritarian, it's becoming increasingly repressive, increasingly silencing opposition, voices of discord and difference. All of these things I think are negative and they have a profound negative impact on China's self-perception, on China's way of dealing with itself and talking about itself as a mature modern society and will have a huge impact on the way China can engage with the rest of the world. So these are very practical things. But there are also reasons why the People's Republic is the way it is. There are very good reasons for the Chinese Communist Party leadership to think and act as it does. And I'll just outline a couple of them. One is the issue of, and this is something not discussed nearly enough in my opinion, but it is a vital one, and it gives you an insight into the mindset within both the People's Republic and also among those who are in contention with it, including America, Australia, Japan, and other countries. And this is summed up in the debate around the concept of what is called peaceful evolution, or in Chinese, 和平演变. Now, I won't go into the great long background about peaceful evolution and all of its facets, but it's put simply, this was approach. China is established as a socialist people's republic in the 1940s, late 40s, early 50s, and it becomes part of what is called the socialist bloc. This is countries that at that time were under the tutelage or leadership of the Soviet Union, the first socialist country in the world led by a radical, originally a radical communist party, less radical with time. It's a one-party state that was aimed at enacting the laws of history by dragging the vast majority of people into the modern world and creating a more equitable, open and democratic society on the basis of prosperity. This is the aim of socialism and the realization eventually of a fairly utopic version of communism, the realization of a better society for humanity. This is one of the great ideologies of the 20th century. The socialist bloc consisted of countries in Eastern Europe, gradually Southeast Asia, the People's Republic, and then half of Korea, as you well know. He Pingyan, Bien, or Peaceful Evolution, was a policy formulated on the basis of American discussions in the 1940s and 50s about how do we, 
as a modern, democratic, powerful, global power that represents market liberal democracy, how do we deal with this socialist world in the long run? There is, of course, military confrontation. There is various ways of countering their policies. But we can also hope that over the long run, we will encourage in these countries through trade, through cultural contact, through the media, through contact with their more enlightened members in their society, through exchanges with them, we will encourage a form of what they call peaceful evolution. That is a gradual transformation of these one-party states into something that was a bit more liberal, a bit more open, a bit more international. In some cases, it was believed that by doing this, engaging in cultural exchange, or putting pressure on governments, or encouraging dissidents, propagating jazz music, encouraging an understanding of abstract art, and so on and so forth. These are all things that were done under the aegis of peaceful evolution, which was a policy proposed in the late 1950s by America's then Secretary of State, John Foster Dulles, D-U-L-L-E-S. If you've been to Washington, one of the airports in Washington is named after John Foster Dulles. Um, a right-wing Christian capitalist, incredibly wealthy, competent, smart character. He was the one who formulated this concept of peaceful evolution. It was on the basis of many other discussions and debates about how do we deal with the socialist world without resorting to warfare. So the policy to engage and undermine socialist countries through culture, through economics, through appeals to the individual, through art, through ideas, through diplomacy, through exchanges, was one that was launched in the 1950s. It immediately led to people in the Soviet Union saying this is a part of a Western plot to keep us down, to undermine socialism, to corrupt our rise on the world stage. In China, Chairman Mao in 1959 called emergency meetings to discuss John Foster Dulles's concept of He Ping Yen, Bien, peaceful evolution. And I would say from 59 to now, in many regards, China has been at constant warfare with the Western concept, the American-based concept of peaceful evolution. Now, if you want to understand the mindset of the People's Republic and many of the things that have happened in the People's Republic, it's essential to appreciate this form of warm war or cool war, not cold war. The Liangzhan, as some people call it in China, Liangzhan, chilly war. It's been overlooked too often. Now, I'll just raise a number of, a number of cases to do with He Ping Yen, Bien, or Peaceful Evolution, just so that you know I'm not talking about some ancient historical artifact, but something that is very, very practical. After all, if China were to become a market democracy, it would act more, as they always say in the States, like us, i.e., like Japan, or like other major allies of the States, um, one thinks in the United Kingdom or Germany, it would act in ways that America could influence outcomes more easily. It would have a greater sway over trade relationships, a greater sway over strategic relationships. It would make American multinationals, not the American government, but American and other multinationals, make it easier for them to do business worldwide. That's one way of understanding things. He Ping Yen Bien. It's been raised many times since 1978, since the reform period began. We discussed the, the second 30 years, that is the post-Maoist era. We can, I could go back and analyze the whole Maoist era in terms of Mao's constant obsession with peaceful evolution and also Soviet revisionism, but we don't have time for that. But in, since 1978, there have been a number of major political and cultural purges that have changed the face of China that relate directly to the purge and attack on peaceful evolution. I'll just raise a couple of them. 1979, the arrest of Wei Jingsheng, who called for the fifth modernization in China, democratization. That was part of what Deng Xiaoping would call a struggle against bourgeois liberalization. And bourgeois liberalization is a key term meaning turning China into a bourgeois-like liberal market democracy like that of the United States or other countries, i.e. representing a form of peaceful evolution. 1986-87, there was a major uprising of students against the Chinese government over media freedom. 
and other political masses uh, protests in favor of political reform. It was crushed. It was part of an attempt, the Chinese said, to, for bourgeois liberals in the Chinese government, like Hu Yaobang, the then party secretary, who's too liberal, wanting to see China transform into a more politically moderate and open society, part of the struggle against peaceful evolution. 1989, a mass rebellion of people in China's cities, some 20 Chinese cities, people rebelled against the government for a range of things. The first reason was corruption, now easily forgotten. I might talk about that a bit later. Other reasons related to the death of Huyabang. Other people were using the protest to complain about the government, demand media freedom, to demand democratic change, and so on and so forth. Inchoate, ill-expressed, vague ideas. Just a general sense that the country was heading in the economically incorrect direction, that people didn't have enough say in the politics of the time, and that they'd give, been given, people had been given false hope that democratic or moderate political reform would further enable China to become a modern and powerful country. After June the 4th, that is the Beijing massacre, when untold numbers of people died in Peking, following the repression of June the 4th, Deng Xiaoping in his first speech in the party headquarters in the center of Peking declared that the struggle that the party had engaged in with the rebellious students and citizens who, he said, were partly manipulated by American agents and a global cabal of people wanting to corrupt and overwhelm, overcome the Communist Party. It was part of China's long-term struggle against, you got it, peaceful evolution. Again, most people ignored Deng Xiaoping's statements. Most people regarded Deng as making up excuses for repressing the students. Um, most of the interpretations of 1989 in the mainstream media are less than helpful in understanding a Chinese reality. Since then, Bien, peaceful evolution, has been frequently mentioned by the Chinese media and by Chinese propagandists. It's written into the basic propaganda materials of the People's Republic. It is a basic underlying theme of Xi Jinping's policies in dealing with, right now, two weeks ago, they, were, they just closed off discussion of a major new law on NGOs and civil society. They've been discussing new internet laws and national security and internet security, um, new laws to do new forms of party control over the legal system, and so on and so forth. All of it is underpinned by a basic belief that China must counter the negative corrupting influences of peaceful evolution and attempts to turn China into a kind of mass liberal democracy that would lead to chaos, massive, even greater corruption, social disquiet, class warfare, and eventual social collapse. The Communist Party argues that for all of their faults, and they're sometimes quite capable of recognizing their limitations, their political faults, and their appalling history, but they argue equally that the adverse side, the other side of the of the political spectrum, that of American style or Western style liberal democracy would lead China to chaos, social collapse and economic disaster. And that's the case they make. Um, sadly, the Americans over the last 70 years have done their level best to prove the Chinese right. And therefore we all have a huge problem.